So moving on with um, the morning. So our next speaker is from ATC Manufacturing. Um, everyone I'm sure is familiar with David Leach. When I started into thermoplastic composites and he was one of the people that I was told I need to get to know and get to understand what he's doing because he's really driving the future, um, particularly in North America of what's going on in this area. So David has over 30 years of experience in thermoplastic polymers and composites for high performance applications. His careers include in materials and fabrication research and development, applications, operations, business development. So as you can see, he's pretty much had his finger everywhere and has um, a lot of information because of that. He has authored many technical papers and two book chapters, and he has been the co-chair of the Composites World High Performance Residence Conference. So with that, David, I'm gonna hand it over to you. All uh, right, uh, thank you. Uh, just checking, is everybody uh, seeing my presentation screen okay? Yes, sir, you're perfect. Okay, all right, excellent. All right, let me just get uh, queued up here. I think we're all learning about doing uh, Zoom presentations online. Um, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, and also uh, thank you to Chris uh, for the excellent uh, keynote. Uh, I'll be talking today uh, about uh, continuous fiber thermoplastics, uh, specifically for aircraft, of course. Uh, so this will be building on uh, a lot of what uh, Chris has talked about as well, but focusing in a couple of particular areas of the high rate manufacturing. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, ATC, uh, we were founded in 2004 by a, a former Boeing engineer. So we've always been very closely aligned to uh, the aerospace industry. Um, he had been involved in some of the early work uh, at Boeing and thought there was a very uh, great uh, future and opportunity in continuous thermoplastics and aerospace. So he uh, founded uh, ATC uh, on that basis. So we're only involved with continuous fiber thermoplastics and specifically uh, for aerospace and other high performance applications. Uh, we do manufacture at high volumes, around 80,000 parts per month for aircraft. Uh, in fact, we supplied a little over a million uh, parts last year. Um, over the years, we gradually grew and moved into the purpose-built facility that you see in the picture here and in my background in 2015. Um, and of course, being aerospace oriented, we are qualified to all the uh, standard uh, aerospace requirements, not only ISO, but also the aerospace standard AS9100 um, and NADCAP for specific processes. And we perform all of our activities in-house here, uh, actually in uh, northern Idaho in the uh, inland northwest region. So that's manufacturing of parts, uh, finishing. Uh, Chris mentioned this, uh, we actually do paint about 25% of the parts we supply uh, are either uh, primed or indeed have a uh, finish, complete finish coat uh, on them. We've been involved in developing some surface prep techniques specifically for painting. Uh, also all the quality inspections, non-destructive um, and uh, dimensional inspections. We have a research and development group uh, also our program management, uh, new product introduction, uh, and also uh, all our administration and management. So that's a kind of quick overview of uh, ATC. Um, talking about thermoplastic composites, uh, as with any transport thing that moves application, we're really concerned about a combination of weight, performance, and cost. And in particular in uh, aerospace or aircraft, weight, of course, is always uh, very important. That's been one of the big drivers for composites in general. Um, performance, because uh, clearly these materials have to perform not only to uh, very uh, everything from uh, say uh, 100 and, uh, around 120 Fahrenheit or 50 centigrade in normal operation down to about minus uh, 65 Fahrenheit or minus 55 centigrade. Um, and obviously cost uh, always comes into it as well. So in terms of the weight aspect, that's driven by the reinforcement in particular. So uh, the materials we're dealing with are usually highly reinforced, um, typically up to around 60% fiber volumes with continuous or long fibers. Um, and also we tend to predominantly be using uh, carbon fibers in our application, uh, some glass, but 
nearly all of it is carbon, particularly the newer applications. Um, some of the performance aspects obviously are, are covered by the fibers, but in particular driven by the polymers. So we're looking for polymers with very high mechanical performance, uh, typically fairly high service temperatures, but as I mentioned, we also go quite cold, so they have to have quite a wide range of service temperatures. Uh, environmental resistance to a wide range of uh, different fluids uh, and different environments. And uh, as we mentioned, flammability, uh, clearly particularly important if you're looking at uh, aircraft interior applications, but even in structural applications, flammability is always a consideration. Um, a couple of as other aspects uh, considering aerospace, build rates of course are typically fairly low uh, and thermoplastics tend to lend themselves to a relatively high production rate. So that tends to favor parts that are used repeatedly in aircraft. Uh, often if we're looking at just one part per aircraft, that's where the, the business case can be a little more challenging. Um, also, of course, we have the regulatory and quality requirements, which means there's a great amount of uh, testing, qualification, approvals have to be done before we ever put a material or a particular part uh, on an aircraft. And also that leads to the fact that once, uh, once a part is uh, on the aircraft, it's often very hard to make any changes to it without going through a great deal of additional testing. Um, Quality requirements, of course, uh, right from raw material through to finished part in terms of uh, monitoring the processes and having full traceability. Uh, of course, another consideration with uh, aircraft or aerospace applications is insertion opportunities are often relatively infrequent compared to other industries. Um, new aircraft programs in particular only come along often once every few years. And so uh, I think Chris touched on the, uh, the time that it has taken and the different waves of sort of insertion. But again, those opportunities don't come along too often. Although once um, materials and parts are on an aircraft, then they tend to be there for the life of the program, which of course can be many, many tens of years. Now, uh, Chris um, talked to some of the benefits of thermoplastics, so I won't go into uh, all of these, but of course we have typically uh, notably lower recurring cost and also higher performance. Um, also the non-recurring cost um, aspects like the num because of the fast cycle times, uh, one piece of capital equipment, like a, a press, for instance, can make many thousands of parts uh, in a month, never mind a year. Uh, also tooling, typically, uh, again, because of the fast cycle times, you only need one tool, even for a relatively uh, frequently used uh, part. You don't need to make multiple tools or rate tooling, as you would often see. Um, and certainly the thermoplastic polymers we're looking at have high performance. Um, Chris also discussed some of the aspects of uh, the sort of no refrigeration, uh, no aspects such as shelf life, uh, out time, out of autoclave processing. Um, it's also worth pointing out that because of the fact that you don't have to refrigerate the materials and you don't have a shelf life and you have rapid uh, processing, uh, we can also support uh, often short lead time requirements with thermoplastics. For instance, if you have a AOG aircraft on ground situation, we can often make a part very quickly in thermoplastics. Um, and we also touched on the environmental friendly and end of life recyclability aspects of thermoplastics as well. In our experience, uh, working with customers, we typically see around a 30% reduction uh, relative to a thermoset part. Uh, the, the most common comparison being an epoxy type uh, part. Um, now, as we've mentioned, the material cost is often higher for thermoplastics. Often that's driven by the polymers. The high performance polymers are still relatively expensive. And to be fair, the, uh, the pre-pregging or impregnation type processes are often more challenging because of the temperatures and viscosities of the material. But there's a very substantial uh, reduction in fabrication cost. Now, I, I didn't know which uh, charts uh, Chris was going to use, but I see we actually chose the same one. In fact, uh, Chris's colleague, uh, Randy Wilkerson, who's a uh, Boeing Technical Fellow, 
uh, used uh, this chart at a recent uh, ACMA, American Composite Manufacturers Association uh, conference, uh, that shows the uh, recurring cost uh, of a part in uh, dollars per pound relative uh, to the part weight. And uh, as this illustrates, as you go from small parts through to larger parts, of course, there's a spectrum across all the different materials. But certainly up to uh, moderate sized parts in the region of around, uh, say, 10 pounds or so, thermoplastic composites uh, certainly win out quite considerably. Again, predominantly because of the, uh, the very fast uh, cycle times. Now, if we look at the, uh, the polymers that we're considering, uh, many of you will be very familiar with this uh, typical uh, polymer uh, pyramid that we often see, uh, which is often segmented into uh, three or four uh, segments, depending on how it's organized, going through uh, commodity uh, engineering up to high performance polymers, and often with a couple of facets of amorphous and semi-crystalline polymers. Um, and of course, as we go up the pyramid, the polymer cost tends to rise. That's often driven by the performance drivers, particularly service temperature and mechanical performance. So in the, uh, the larger area of the pyramid at the bottom, we tend to have the commodity polymers, which tend to be quite cost sensitive and used in many consumer products. We move up to the engineering uh, uh, polymers with uh, a number of performance drivers often used in aspects like automotive and durable goods, and then into the high performance end that's driven very much by the service temperature and properties. And uh, so this tends to be the area that we're in for uh, aircraft uh, applications, be the, again, interiors or uh, structural. So to look at some of the particular polymers, I know this is uh, quite a, a technical audience, I'm sure at SPE, so to highlight a few of the families, uh, first of all, two amorphous polymers. Um, indeed, the first one, a highlighted polyethosulfone, but there is a whole family of uh, different polysulfone polymers. Uh, so I picked one particular one, polyethosulfone, um, and then also polyetherimide amorphous polymers, both with relatively high TGs. Um, one of the aspects you'll notice with uh, all of the polymers, whether they're amorphous or semi-crystalline, is these tend to be uh, highly aromatic. Of course, that gives you the uh, higher temperature performance. Um, and also, uh, the, um, uh, often with uh, quite uh, relatively sort of stiff backbone linkages as well. If we move that into the um, uh, semi-crystalline polymers, PPS, um, as we've said, PPS is probably at about the, the lowest end of what's typically used in any of the structural applications. Uh, there's a lot of discussion, of course, around service temperature with the semi-crystalline polymers, uh, because you can certainly use them often up uh, closer to the, uh, the TG of the material. Um, and then PEAK and PEC, obviously representing the uh, sort of poly aralether ketone families. Uh, obviously very similar just with uh, either the ether, ether ketone linkage or the ether ketone ketone linkage. So yielding fairly similar glass transition temperatures and uh, melt temperatures. Um, if we then take a look at uh, kind of how these stack up, again, the two amorphous polymers that are highlighted, uh, PEI and polyethosulfone. Uh, and then the uh, semi-crystalline polymers. And I've also included a sort of recent uh, addition, what's referred to as the low melt polyarolether ketone, um, which has a little lower uh, melt temperature, although pretty similar TG and melt temperatures to some of the other uh, ether ketone polymers. One of the features you'll notice from these materials though is that they all have quite high process temperatures. We're talking about process temperatures uh, in excess of uh, 300 centigrade typically with uh, all of these materials um, and uh, often uh, up closer to uh, 400 centigrade indeed as well. Uh, if we then come on, moving on from the polymers and look at the various product forms, uh, we go from short fiber material Right, uh, right the way through chopped materials, longer fiber, fabrics, uh, and up to UD tape. So 
I'll be focusing in particular on the uh, fabric materials uh, and the UD tapes here at the uh, higher performance area, which are also uh, usually um, quite highly uh, reinforced, at least 55 to 60% uh, fiber volume. So if we look at the uh, forms, there's various different uh, types of material, fully impregnated, which are typically unidirectional tapes, so the narrow toes, uh, as Chris mentioned, 12 inches, a few available at 24 inches, or the narrow, narrower toes. Uh, obviously, with these being highly reinforced, uh, impregnating the, uh, the very uh, viscous polymers is often a challenge, and so, uh, you do see some uh, variation in sort of quality of uh, impregnation, quality of the tape. One advantage of these materials is being fully impregnated. They can be uh, quite rapidly processed. You don't go, have to go through any impregnation process during fabrication. But of course, these are quite stiff and bawdy material. An alternate form is what would be referred to as the semi-pregs, which are often applied to uh, fabric type materials that are partially impregnated in some way. Uh, this might be a film that's tacked to the fabric or powder coated materials or commingled materials where you have uh, polymer fibers and the reinforcing fibers mingled and then woven together. Certainly an advantage is these materials are drapeable at room temperature, but of course you have to impregnate them during processing. And uh, the micrograph at the bottom here shows the uh, relatively resin rich areas uh, on, the, uh, on the fabric form uh, of a powder coated material. And of course that does have to be impregnated during the, uh, the, pre the, during the fabrication process. And then the other option is uh, laminates, or what is sometimes referred to as organo sheets, uh, where you obtain a fully consolidated laminate, fully impregnated, uh, multiply uh, material that's fully ready for post-processing. Um, of course, these uh, can be used pretty much as is, although the, uh, the challenge can be that uh, you're stuck with a certain number of plies and a certain layer of orientation when you get that. So you lose some of the flexibility of starting from a uh, pre-preg level material. Now I'm gonna focus on uh, two processes here, uh, the continuous compression molding process uh, first. Um, so this is a kind of simplified uh, diagram of the, uh, the process. So we run from uh, left to right as we go through this. So we have uh, different plies of material on a creel. This shows um, kind of in a simple case, uh, six, uh, six plies uh, of material being fed in here with uh, release films, which could be uh, aluminum or aluminum foil, uh, steel foil, uh, or indeed a, a polyimide type um, film uh, alternatively. Um, these plies are pulled in uh, to the, uh, the, the set of dies that we have. And this could be a flat die or uh, in order to make a laminate, or it could be a shaped die in order to make a profile. Uh, so the front end of the press, the material comes in relatively cool. It's heated up, consolidated. And then the, uh, the right hand side of the press as the material goes through is cooler in order to cool the material back down uh, at a controlled rate. So the material is pulled uh, incrementally through the line. The press opens up uh, very slightly uh, at each uh, increment in order to allow the material to pull forward. So it can be considered a little like a, a pultrusion process, except that the die opens each step. That, uh, that releases the pressure to enable you to keep the ply orientations as they should, uh, uh, as you want them to. Um, some of the advantages of this material is it's, uh, of this process is it's very cost effective. Um, highly automated. And when we're talking about automation, it's also worth remembering we're not just about talking about removing touch labor. It's also about consistency of process in automated processes. Also, you can use a variety of product forms. Certainly, it's used uh, quite extensively for unidirectional tapes, but also uh, you can use uh, fabric materials through this as well. Um, in terms of some of the challenges, 
Um, to be fair, it's more cost effective with fully impregnated materials uh, like the UD tapes I was showing. If you have to impregnate as you're going through this, then basically you have to slow down the process to allow for uh, the time for that to take place. So it, it becomes a little less efficient. Um, also, again, in fairness, tools to make the profile shapes can be quite, uh, quite expensive. Chris was referring to about a meter long die. And so that's a fairly highly machined uh, tool that you need. Uh, again, if you're making large volumes, that's still uh, cost effective uh, for the amount of material and the throughput. Now, what I'd like to, to also focus on is the thermal cycle. So these are some traces from uh, actual runs that we perform in house here, where we have multiple thermocouples uh, in the uh, part as it goes through. So there's about six thermocouples here. Um, so as the material enters the die, which is at the, uh, the zero time on this uh, chart, it heats up fairly rapidly. Um, the material is in uh, contact uh, through the applied pressure. Obviously, you don't want to overpressurize it in the, uh, the early stages where uh, it is gradually, uh, gradually melting. Um, but it heats up quite quickly through uh, contact pressure. And of course, carbon fiber is also very thermally conductive. So some of the material that's further on through the die conducts back into the input material. Uh, we do have a relatively narrow process window with many of these materials. Obviously, we have to get into a state where we ensure that they are fully melted. Um, but uh, generally, once you start to get above about 400 centigrade, you're going to start to see uh, degradation processes starting. Obviously, that is time, temperature, and uh, atmosphere dependent. But generally, you don't want to go above 400. So. You, uh, you want to make sure the material is melted, but it doesn't have to be necessarily there for a very long time. Um, with our semi-crystalline materials, we do want to be careful about the cooling rates to ensure that we develop the correct level of crystallinity. And so again, we typically have a window of uh, temperature and time in which crystallization will occur. And of course, that is going to be material dependent. This chart happens to be for a PEKK material. Um, peak and uh, PPS do tend to crystallize a little faster. So that can also dictate your, uh, your sort of line speed uh, through, the, uh, through the manufacturing process. And generally, you want to make sure that the material is below TG by the time it uh, exits the die so that it does not uh, deconsolidate. So several of the advantages, this is a continuous process. Uh, if you can read the time scale at the bottom here, we're talking about processing in a matter of minutes. And we get a fully finished uh, high quality laminate out of the process. Uh, in terms of continuous compression molding, um, this uh, illustrates a couple of uh, C channel profiles. One is actually as made, one is painted. Of course, you can make a wide variety of different profiles depending on the die configurations that you use. Uh, in the center, you see actually a fully finished part coming out of the, uh, the die. And our uh, piece of equipment, which is relatively a small uh, footprint, um, it is a continuous process. We would typically run off about 150 foot lengths and supply those in roughly 25 foot lengths uh, to the customer. Moving on to a different process now for uh, rapidly fabricating parts in terms of stamp forming. So in the case of stamp forming, we start with a, a blank uh, that is generally pre-consolidated, uh, might be absolutely fully consolidated or uh, even partially consolidated. Heat that up rapidly in an oven, often an infrared oven. Uh, transfer it across quickly to a uh, die set that's in a quickly closing uh, press. Close that quickly in order to form and cool the part. So a key aspect to uh, keeping uh, the fast cycle time is that you keep the tool at a constant temperature. So you're not cycling the tool. Similar to the, what you would do with an injection molding tool, which you would also keep at uh, constant temperature, of course. Um, so one of the, uh, some of the advantages here are the very short cycle time. So you can get high rate and volume, low recurring cost. Um, we do require a creek pre-consolidated blank. And of course, there's certain amount of limitations on the part complexity. We are dealing with continuous fiber. 
uh, reinforced materials. Uh, and of course, we do need a match die tool. So we need a two-sided tool. So if we look at the uh, stamp forming thermal cycle, this is a, a little different to what we saw in the CCM. Um, again, this is a actual uh, thermocouple traces from a real part. This is about a five millimeter thick part, around 470 millimeters in length, around uh, 18 inches. Um, it is a uh, structural uh, L-shaped part, so we have thermocouples in different places within the part and through the thickness, and you'll, you'll uh, see that as we go through this. So the blank heats up uh, relatively rapidly uh, in the oven. Again, we have to ensure it uh, achieves full melt uh, right across the part, both uh, through the thickness and uh, in all the aspects of the, uh, the part right along the length. Um, it's then transferred over to the tool. Uh, you can see the temperature starts to drop uh, just a little bit here. That's the, uh, that's the transfer process. And then, of course, when it hits the tool, uh, the temperature starts to drop quite quickly. And that's where we actually see a divergence. The uh, thermocouples that are right on the surface, of course, cool very quickly as they're in almost direct contact with the tool. The ones that are in the interior cool a little slower, but they equilibrate uh, relatively uh, quickly. Um, the cooling process in this case, uh, we, have to, uh, we have to be more concerned as the uh, cooling is sort of to an isothermal tool. So we're more concerned with ensuring that we spend sufficient time in the crystallization temperature range. This is where we do uh, sometimes run into uh, challenges in managing the process. The tooling obviously has to be cool enough that uh, the material will, will freeze and become form stable, um, but you do want it to uh, crystallize form. Actually, this is a case where uh, uh, faster crystallization is sometimes actually a disadvantage in that if the material starts to crystallize too fast, it'll actually freeze in place rather than allowing the flow processes to occur. So we can achieve rapid uh, cycle time with moderate complexity and uh, size apart. Certainly, we fabricate parts up to uh, more than a quarter inch thick and around uh, 50 inches in length. So to illustrate some of the stamp formed applications, these certainly started out with relatively simple uh, clips and brackets initially moving on to various stiffeners and challenge channels and then now to uh, uh, primary structural parts much uh, thicker also much more dimensionally uh, critical and larger parts as you see uh, from the uh, this aircraft uh, seat application here as well now in all of these processes we do need to uh, take account of the processing science particularly because we're dealing with highly reinforced uh, materials so there's uh, really four flow processes that we need to take account of. The first one is uh, resin percolation or simple resin flow through the, uh, the fiber bed. And this is very diagrammatic. A 60% fiber volume material, of course, uh, actually has the fibers much more tightly packed. And then the transverse ply, uh, ply flow as uh, pressure is applied to an individual ply uh, on a tool. And then as we go up, uh, in terms of the microstructure, you then have intralaminar shear within a ply, shearing within the ply, and then, of course, between the plies. So we have to take account of all of these flow processes as we're starting from a uh, flat sheet and forming it into a complex shape. Uh, we also use the uh, Aniform software, which uh, Chris mentioned, in order to model the, uh, the flow processes. Uh, and as you see, these can be quite extreme. This is a pretty complex part, but through that we can see where the, uh, where the flow processes are going to drive us. Um, the other thing that uh, particularly the designers are concerned about though is what happens to all those fiber orientations, because unlike a thermoset, the fiber orientations are actually changing during the fabrication process. So we have to be sure that we know what orientations the fibers in all the different plies are going to end up at. Um, so there's been significant advances in this over the, uh, over the last few years in, in really having confidence in this. 
Um, so finally, uh, my final slide here, uh, certainly rapid fabrication of, uh, of the continuous materials gives uh, quite a lot of advantages, low recurring and non-recurring cost, and is quite well established for the small to medium sized parts. As we said, anything from a few inches up to uh, certainly a few feet in size, also for the continuous molded profiles. The technology is certainly expanding to larger and more complex parts, including variable thickness, primary structure, and I think Arndt will be talking a lot more about assemblies. And certainly uh, we're anticipating there'll be significantly more use of thermoplastics on some of the, uh, the next generation of aircraft. So thank you. So David, thank you very much. Um, as a reminder for everyone, there is a Q&A button on the bottom. If you want to uh, ask a question, simply type in that and we will get to it. I see that there is a question that came through the chat function. Um, it says, why the need for a low melting peak? Is it primarily for processes where you need lower crystallization rates? Um, well, as, as we indicated, the, uh, the temperature uh, window is relatively uh, small that we have with many of these materials, having to get up to uh, maybe 370, 380 centigrade. So the low melting temperature certainly gives you a uh, wider range of uh, uh, process window. Um, I would say it's not so much about crystallization rate, but process window. It can also give you advantages where you are doing uh, secondary thermal processes. Uh, for example, overmolding, um, where you take a continuous fiber material and then overmold it with a, uh, a short fiber material, as an example. Uh, so it can be an advantage to have differential melt temperatures there, where the continuous material has a lower melt temperature. Uh, and you're overmolding it with a higher melt temperature material so that as the uh, flow front of the uh, overmolded material hits the continuous material, it'll actually more readily cause melting. Uh, can also be an advantage in some of the welding processes, particularly if you want to uh, include a, a slightly lower melt temperature material uh, in the well in order to uh, avoid melting the, uh, the bulk of the continuous material. David, I think as an extension of that, something just came in through the Q&As. It says, when processing PAEKs, what's the most important factor that you need to consider? Um, you address some of the milk temperature, crystallization rate, TG, and then how would you say that all of these materials compare? Uh, right, that's, that's a pretty broad question. But yeah, obviously, there's a, a little bit of uh, all of the above. Probably uh, your first consideration, of course, is melt temperature. You have to ensure that you are you're fully melted. Um, you you want to be ens truly ensure you melt all the crystals so that you don't create any nucleation sites and you obtain the best opportunity for the uh, flow processes. I'd say in managing the process, though, probably the crystallization uh, temperature and rate are the most critical ones. Um, as an example, uh, we would uh, typically run a whole range of uh, DSC uh, graphs at different uh, cooling rates in order to establish what's both the crystallization window, temperature window, uh, and also what is the rate of crystallization. Um, especially in the uh, stamp forming process, that's often quite critical to determining where is your, uh, uh, what, what's your tool temperature going to need to be uh, in order to ensure that you get uh, full crystallization. And then to a smaller extent, the TG, and you do want to ensure the material is fully form stable and doesn't deconsolidate once it comes, uh, comes off the tool. Um, in terms of the different materials, we certainly worked with all of them, the low melt PEK, peak, and PEKK. And I'd say all of them uh, certainly can be processed. Um, there's not, not a, not a, um, uh, I uh, spend a lot of my career on the material side, and I always tended to think that fast crystallization, faster crystallization was always the best thing to have, right? Um, having got to uh, spend a lot more time on the fabrication side in the second half of my career, I find sometimes uh, a slightly slower crystallization is actually a little easier to, uh, to work with in terms of rapid forming. 
So I'd say certainly the low melt P, PAEK and PEKK uh, can give some advantages in that aspect. But again, all of the materials can, can certainly be uh, processed uh, quite well. And I, I know I think we're probably out of time, but I uh, left my details up there if anyone wants to contact me uh, directly. We still have a couple more minutes, David, um, before the, right, the, sure. the next figure. Yeah. The next, um, our, our doesn't go on until 10.45. Oh, right, uh, sorry, right, okay. So um, we, we built in bio breaks, and so if you are yeah. in that category, you can take one now. <laughs> if you're still yeah. interested, stick around. Sure. So building of low, low melt PAEK, it says it's getting a lot of temperature for high, or a lot of attention for high performance. Uh, can you comment on what the main difference you see as a benefit outside of the lower melting processing temperatures? Um, well, I'm, I wouldn't, uh, at least the, the low melt PAEKs that we have worked with uh, also seem to have a little lower viscosity, uh, which can be an advantage. Um, uh, obviously, with thermoplastic materials, you tend to be talking about pretty high viscosities in general. It's like kind of processing chewing gum. Uh, so uh, the um, uh, the lower melt uh, materials, uh, I'm not certain that it's inherent to them being lower melt, but they do seem to have a little uh, lower viscosity. Um, and as I mentioned in uh, answering the previous uh, question as well, it certainly gives you more flexibility in terms of doing any uh, further processing on the materials, the overmolding, welding processes um, uh, can, can give you that benefit of having a, a different um, uh, or welding them with, uh, with different materials. I think of also building off of that, uh, something, a question that just came in, it says, do you see any difference as it relates specifically to processing um, between an amorphous and a semi-crystalline polymer? Um, well, yes, yeah, so, uh, obviously amorphous materials are in many ways a lot easier to work with that you don't have to worry about the, uh, the crystallization rates on cool down. Uh, you can really design your process just around Um, and also you have a much uh, wider window in that the material will, will flow right from process temperature uh, almost down to TG. So typically the amorphous materials are, are generally a lot easier to work with. Uh, in terms of the, the actual process temperature, you also have uh, a lot more flexibility. Uh, indeed, you can, you can use that to kind of tune your process a little. Um, you know, if you, if you know you're going to need a, a lot of flow in the part, if it's a very complex part, then you can push that, uh, the, the process temperature, uh, particularly in the oven, I'm thinking of stamp forming in particular here, push the temperature in the oven a little higher in order to uh, get the viscosity down a little lower for when it uh, hits the tool. Or if that's not quite so critical, then you, uh, you know, you can keep it to a more moderate temperature. So certainly amorphous materials are, um, um, much easier to work with from a, a processing point of view. Um, and again, uh, work very well for aircraft interior uh, applications, um, although typically they're, they're not used in uh, the more structural uh, applications, again, because of the environmental resistance of most amorphous polymers relative to the semi-crystalline ones. And I have a, a question, if I may. So if I'm looking at all of the, the parts that you're making um, and you see that you've mentioned continuous carbon fiber, it seems that there may be some design limitations because of that. And I know that there's several universities at least playing with the idea of doing uh, chopped carbon fiber that's highly aligned, mm -hmm. claiming that you can get the same performance as continuous carbon fiber. Um, do you have any thoughts on whether or not this is something that's viable from a production standpoint? Yeah, that's, uh, that's definitely something that, that uh, we're interested in, I think is a, is a good opportunity for the future. Uh, clearly, uh, the continuous materials, um, the fibers are pretty much inextensible in the fiber direction. So that is a limitation on processing, particularly when you're taking uh, the fibers kind of around corners, around tight bends, as we might want. Um, and so uh, a, a material that is uh, 
discontinuous definitely has some uh, many advantages there. There's been several approaches to do that. One is to take continuous materials and simply chop it down into shorter lengths, like a half inch or one inch length and go through a compression molding process. Um, another one is there's been various uh, stretch broken type materials that have been used in the past. Uh, and then, as you mentioned, there is uh, aligned discontinuous materials across the University of Delaware with the tough material uh, that was used in the recent uh, DARPA uh, tailorable um, forming uh, uh, work that was covered quite extensively recently in Composites World. Um, so all of those, are, I think, are very interesting opportunities. Typically, the aerospace designers, um, they've been concerned about uh, anything that's a discontinuous fiber even though uh, all of us in the composites industry understand that you know, a fairly short fiber length actually gives you full transfer of the, uh, the fibers. You know, it doesn't take very much of a length to get to the critical length, um, but generally um, aerospace designers are often concerned about any uh, cut fibers, what are the implications around edges or holes. Um, so I think the design community needs to get comfortable with that. Um, and then also, of course, orientation aspects. Certainly, if you can keep those fibers in full alignment, even if they are discontinuous, that's great. But any of the processes where the alignment may um, not, be, uh, not be defined, actually the chopped compression molding is a good example of that. Um, you still have uh, uh, the fibers uh, kind of running in specific directions, but modeling that can be quite hard as to uh, how those fibers uh, rearrange themselves. So again, designers kind of get concerned about um, re reorientation of discontinuous fibers uh, during processing, which is much more prone to happen than uh, if you have continuous fibers. And there's one more that came to me through the chat function. Mm -hmm. So we'll finish with this one. Mm -hmm. It says, can you comment as to whether there are any aspects or concerns regarding aging of thermoplastics um, versus thermosets, specifically if they're being used at elevated temperatures close to the TG? Um, yeah, that uh, obviously that is something that people would uh, sometimes uh, be concerned about, particularly um, reorientation of the, uh, the amorphous regions and potential embrittlement. Um, I'd say there has been quite a bit of long-term aging work. relatively uh, minimal. Um, certainly that, that is a reason for keeping uh, below the TG. Uh, again, we didn't go into it in, uh, in, in this presentation, but uh, typically for aerospace applications, you do keep uh, below the TG. Um, certainly in North America, uh, through the uh, Composite Materials Handbook Guidelines, there's been uh, a tendency over the years to use the TG minus 50 Fahrenheit as a maximum service temperature. Now, there's a lot of discussion about whether that is relevant or not, because it was really developed for uh, thermoset materials, which of course lose uh, uh, pretty much all uh, their performance when you go through TG, and whether that's relevant for semi-crystalline materials. But, uh, at least in North America, people have tended to keep to that. So that gives you uh, quite a large margin between uh, TG and uh, service temperature. Um, but I'd say from the literature work that's been done, uh, generally the, uh, the effects are, uh, have been seen to be uh, quite small, certainly with the higher performance semi-crystalline polymers like the, uh, the PEX and PEAKS. Excellent. And just one more came in, if we mm -hmm. can keep answer quickly, though. And you may want to also put up there your last slide again so people can see your contact information if they have any yeah. other questions. Yeah. Uh, the last one that came in was, um, is there any value for an additive that would improve the flow of PPS in this industry? Um, well, flow in general uh, is always a challenge. Uh, obviously, we love the fact that these materials are fully polymerized, so we're not having to... Uh, uh, to do any uh, chemistry, if you like, during the fabrication, but uh, viscosity of them is always uh, always a challenge, quite honestly, both in terms of manufacturing the materials when you're impregnating the fibers uh, and also when you're forming them. So um, 
yeah, I would guess some sort of additive uh, would be of interest. Uh, obviously, we're a fabricator here, so that would be something that's more relevant to the, uh, the material suppliers. I think, as usual, a concern would be, are there any other um, kind of secondary effects uh, from uh, using an additive? But uh, in general, I'd say that would be of, uh, definitely of interest. Well, perfect, David. Thank you very much on behalf of SPE and uh, everyone online. We want to thank you for your time this morning. It's always great to hear you speak. Um, I look forward to it every time I get an opportunity to do so. And so thanks again um, and hope you can stick around for the rest of the talks today. All right. Uh, yep, certainly will be. Thanks. Thanks, David.